Hello people, welcome back. We're on the third episode now. I can't believe I've been doing this podcast business for three weeks. Who do I think I am? I've had such a busy time at work this week. I'm actually really cherishing this moment sat in my studio in the dark right now, putting this episode together. This week is our first guest on the podcast. I talked to my friend MJ from Queer Movement. MJ is a queer movement specialist. They specialize in working with neurodiverse people, people recovering from top surgery. They actually took me through a big part of my top surgery recovery and I learned so much from them, which I chat about in this episode. So today we are talking about the links between neurodiversity and movement that many neurodiverse folks face when they're trying to figure out or navigate what movement looks like for them. The two are very tightly intertwined and there was honestly no better person to talk to about this. And I know there are so many neurodiverse folks out there that follow me and also that I work with. So I really hope this is helpful for you. And of course, as always, if you have any follow-up questions, just give me a shout. Before we get into today's episode, this is just your little nudge from me that next week from July the 24th I am running a free week of online coaching for the LGBTQ plus community we're gonna smash a few workouts together I'm gonna take you through laying the foundations to build some solid habits so if this sounds like your thing I've got a few spaces left so just head to fuzzcultureclub.com slash cultivate trial cultivate with an eight to claim your place and I will see you on Monday cool I have left you waiting long enough let's get into it Hey, MJ, thank you so much for joining me today. You've been the name on my list since the idea of me doing this came about. So I appreciate it a lot. Can you like give us a brief intro if that's cool? Yeah, of course. Well, one, thank you so much for asking me. I loved receiving that message. I was like, hell yeah, absolutely. My name is MJ. I'm a queer body movement specialist, probably most known online for my Instagram page, Queer Movement where I really focus on information and movement-based stuff for queer bodies, mostly centered around gender-affirming surgery preparation and recovery, neurodiversity within queer bodies, and general pain management for queer bodies. So that's what I do. Hell yeah. And the way we met was we did a bit of a skill swap last year, and we we work out programmed for each other. Mm -hmm. And you took me through my top surgery recovery from about the six week point and it was awesome and I learned a huge amount from you and I got all my mobility back and I felt great and I've helped other people do it since as well. Can you help me with chronic back pain that I'm always like chipping away at so feeling mutual. Ah the joys of chronic pain. (laughs) It rears its head. For sure and the irony of us doing a podcast about neurodiversity and movement today is that about 10 minutes before I came on this call I got an email from a Psychiatry UK which are like the people that do the ADHD assessments yeah. saying hello we've got your ADHD assessment it's going to be seven months before we contact you by the way your doctors didn't give us your email address so how do <laughs> how should we contact you and I was like oh the irony of this coming in now To give some context to the episode, we're going to talk a bit about neurodiversity and movement and how it can be helpful, what the barriers are, how they are intertwined and different ways of approaching movement that maybe a lot of us wouldn't really think about. And you made a couple of videos for my clients, which were hugely, hugely helpful for them. They all really appreciated it. And in the time that you made them, I ended up getting referred for an HD referral. So here we are. The neurodiverse folks tend to swarm together in like little wolf packs. So if you start noticing that, you know, a lot of the folks around you are neurodiverse, it's worth, worth checking out. Yeah, literally like 90% of my friends for sure. And then I started meeting and connecting with people in the fitness industry and they were all were as well when we became closer and I found out. But what's your history with neurodiversity, if you don't mind sharing? No, don't mind at all, because I think this is actually a really like great jumping off point for the queer experience. Maybe a little 
bit of a bummer, which I apologize for at the top, but like, this is the reality of it for a lot of folks. So for definitely the majority of my life, I struggled with depression. And I'd say I definitely was like more depressed than I did experience anxiety. But kind of as time went on, I really realized that I was experiencing both in different ways. So this kind of depression and anxiety mix that I tried to work on and, and treat medication, therapy, lifestyle things for a really, really long time. And I then thought that my gender dysphoria was the root of my depression, because once I acknowledged my non-binary identity, things did get a lot better. And I was like, that was, that was just it. But no, I kept being depressed after that. And then it was actually in my gender affirming surgery journey beginning, as I was talking to my doctor to get my referral to kind of kick the process off, she was like, by the way, I'd like you to just research ADHD. And this was the beginning of 2020. So kind of pre, you know, kind of call it out for what it is, pre TikTok. Pre TikTok. And a <laughs> TikTok boom of, you know, information spreading. Like do, you know, TikTok diagnosis has that, you know, it's, it's issues and whatnot. But I think just the pure amount of information that was able to spread through TikTok was really helpful for a lot of people. But she was like, yeah, I want you to look into ADHD. So at the time I'm still thinking that's, you know, hyperactive boys in school. You know what I mean? Like I that was what I had raised and told and believed that it was. So I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, well, you know, I just see on your files, like this depression and anxiety that you've come to us before on, you know, you're on this medication and just the way we're talking and the way you're describing yourself. I'd just like you to look into it. And I was like, oh, are you diagnosing me? And she's like, she kind of got quite stern and she was like, no, and I won't diagnose you. And I was like, oh, okay, sorry. And she's like, a diagnosis can really interfere with gender affirming care because diagnosis of ADHD and autism can be really looked harshly upon by medical professionals as this kind of indication that you don't know yourself and you can't take care of yourself. And how could you possibly make these decisions for yourself? So she was like, no, I'm not going to diagnose you. And I don't recommend until you are done with all the gender affirming care that you want in your life that you seek out a diagnosis, but just like do some research, you know, if you want. And as I think happens with the law of neurodiverse folks, I hyper fixated on it and watched so much content around it. Got so many articles, but videos, TED talks, personal experiences, TikTok was a big help. And again, I think there's this misconception of self-diagnosis where it's like, oh, you watched one TikTok video was like, oh my God, me, and like ran with it. No, like I have probably done, I, I can't think of the equivalent of research into yeah. it and understanding and cross-checking and confirming with folks who do have diagnosis and just this constant, like almost like peer reviewing with all the kind of available online information that I feel very comfortable in a self-diagnosis and know that for me, a formal diagnosis could mess up further medical things I need in the future as a non-binary person. In America, I should specify I'm in the States, so it might be different country to country, but that's sure. the reality of it here. And I'm not taking that risk. So again, I know self-diagnosis can be a bit controversial, but I am very confident in the amount of research and work that I've done. And to have a doctor start me on the path is also a good backup. Absolutely. And we've got we've got both flavors now. So we've got you a lot longer in your journey, very well researched. And then we have me at the other end that is going down the other route because that's how I was referred. And I'm also obviously non-binary and have options for gender affirming care available. And based on the little research I have done and based on the people I've talked to, it is exactly the same in the UK with a diagnosis counting against your gender affirming surgery yeah. because they'll basically throw at you you're not trans you're just autistic or you've just got ADHD yeah. do you know why they link those based on the research you've done do you have any idea why that is the case why they link the assumption of you're not trans you're just neurodiverse yeah is it is it as much of a myth as I don't know, I just listened to an episode of Maintenance Phase today where mm -hmm. they said, like, frogs made people trans because they had problems <laughs> with ovaries. They made people yeah. grow ovaries, so they're not trans, they were just infected by frogs. Is it? Is right. it? Is the link that vague or is there something more substantial? I think this is, I, again, we just before started talking, to, just before starting recording, what I was like, I ramble. So this could be ramble number one. Ramble number coming <laughs> I think what is like from a personal perspective in what I've talked about with my other queer neurodiverse friends, if you think about the Venn diagram of queerness and neuro neurodiversity, it's kind of a circle, right? Like, and it's more which you realized or was a part of your life 
first. Now, again, that's a very broad sweeping statement and a little bit of a joke. Not every queer person is neurodiverse. Not every neurodiverse person is queer. But the intersections of the identity does have a lot of crossovers. And I think you could start a really interesting conversation of does your queerness and acceptance of outside of the norm, lots of quotation marks around <laughs> that, allow you more freedom to look into the other ways that your brain could work and accept about yourself that your brain works differently or perhaps similar if you are neurodiverse there's a lot of evidence of like different neural pathways one of the more recent things i've been looking into is a neurotypical person throughout their life kind of around puberty the brain will start to trim the neural receptors the neural links right yeah. so again the best way to make a direct route is to create loads of roots you see this in like if you see cool like mold studies where they're like we got this like mold and put a piece of cheese and the mold like really spreads out until it finds the cheese and then all the parges converge to that most direct route and it lets the other ones go the brain does the same you're trying to learn a new skill trying to create a new neural connection it sends a lot of pathways out and then the one that is the most efficient gets rooted and the rest gets snipped and so neurotypical people about 50 percent of these neural pathways will get trimmed by adulthood for neurodiverse people, that number drops to 16%. We keep so wow. many more of our pathways, which can have a huge link to introspective issues, sensory issues, emotional regulation, and all these things that kind of come with neurodiversity. And so I think you could also potentially have that. This is MJ theory, not full science, but I think it makes sense how that link to sexuality in that if there was a point in your childhood where you started exploring attraction and attractiveness and you spread all those neurons out of that wider range, that wider scope of who do I find attractive? What do I find attractive? And again, perhaps in neurotypical people, it gets more direct and it's like, it's just this. And they trim the rest of the neurons. And then in perhaps in neurodiverse people, those neurons stay in play, which widens our scope of attraction and acceptance of that attraction. Again, very much a theory, but one I don't see how it couldn't be possible. So to come back to that link of you're not trans, just autistic, ADHD, neurodiverse, I think that could be the true interesting aspect of it. I think from a medical perspective, we get this slightly more unfortunate association of, like we kind of mentioned briefly at the top, like you don't know yourself. I think it's the assumption of your brain isn't normal. So how could you be so sure about this? I think that's the medical system's view of it. Your brain doesn't work right. So you don't know yourself. If you think you're trans, you're not. Whereas I prefer what I said before about like the uh, additional neural pathways and just the way the brain, a neurodiverse brain experiences and sees the world and has a much more open and accepting view. And I think you can also view that in queerness of we're more open, more accepting because we're not considered the norm i think there's there's a, a molding of that right and in general both have this outside of norm position and thus create more acceptance within those communities i've never sort of heard anyone put it like that in all the conversations i've had about queer neurodiversity so that's mm -hmm. that is now making my brain tick a lot <laughs> yeah and again pure theory pure theory but something i've definitely been chipping away at a lot about learning about the brain how it works in neurodiverse brains in particular for sure. I'm I'm gonna throw it out there as a bit of a is a bit of an off the cuff observation, but I'm pretty sure when cis folks or just folks that want forms of gender affirming surgery that aren't linked to being trans, mm -hmm. like I don't know, like a boob job or like yeah. pet implants or liposuction, I'm pretty sure they don't get told that they don't know themselves, so they can't absolutely. have it. So Yeah, absolutely not. No, it's a good paper trail to lean back on to prevent care, which is again why I was warned, warned against that. And not to say that the point of a diagnosis is to provide more support, is to provide more help, is to provide more understanding, especially with ADHD, get you access to medication and all these really important things. And it's such a frustrating situation for that to be like. Yeah, and I suppose as queer people and as trans or gender non-conforming people, we kind of think of everything on a spectrum and very yeah. nuanced and we don't. We don't think of things as black and white ever, really. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're definitely getting more and more to a point when, you know, the umbrella term for queer really fits more and more people yeah. because everything is so much more fluid than the people it's a lot more black and white for. And I, and I guess that 
based on what you just said, that all makes so much sense. Yeah, I think so as well. And I agree that I don't know why you wouldn't embrace fluidity. I don't think it does any harm to do so. Yeah, I mean, I suppose we're forever talking about people not knowing the unknown or understanding it. So instead, they'll be scared of it. And I suppose as neurodiverse people or as queer people, we are maybe very much the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who knows? So getting into neurodiversity, what aspects of the brain are actually impacted by it? Hell yeah. Okay. Again, this is all under the scope of I have so much more to learn, so much more to educate myself on, but I also love what I'm learning and feel confident in what I know already. So very open to, you know, I, I guess being not proven wrong, but like, like disagreed with as long as there's like good info behind that. But also, like I said, confident in what we're about to chat about. So the cerebellum is usually called the little brain, and it's kind of at the base and bottom of the brain. And the way the brain works, again, these are all things I feel like we should be taught within my view is within PE, within physical education. We have a tiny brain in the big brain. We have a tiny brain. The cerebellum takes up 2% of total brain size, mass, but houses 80% of our neurons. So we small. should know that. And we should know that within being taught in biology or PE. Physical education at the moment is just sport. And sports yeah. is valid and good, but it's not physical education. Wild. Oh, it drives me, drives me mad. So the cerebellum is at the base and the bottom of the brain. So the way the brain works is from the bottom up, from the back to the front. So you've kind of got this like upside down L shape in how the brain processes information. And so the cerebellum is one of the first areas to get information from the spinal cord, from the receptors, from the body. And like I said, tiny bit of the brain, the little brain, but 80% of the neurons. And what the cerebellum is mostly responsible for, not solely, but mostly, is accuracy, balance, and coordination, the ABCs of movement, right? And not just movement, but more evidence is coming in to show that the cerebellum is also responsible for the accuracy, balance, and coordination of emotions and our thinking as well. So again, when you look at neurodiversity, and you start seeing these patterns of challenge with introspection, understanding what's happening in your body, what sensations you're feeling, temperature regulation, proprioception, knowing where your body is in space, all these internal senses. Again, in neurodiversity, those are often a little off or very heightened or lessened to a degree that isn't usual. And the same with emotions. Emotional regulation is a huge aspect of ADHD. Rejection sensitivity dysphoria. There's this very big stereotype of autistic people being cold and unemotional, which is just not true. But again, it's all to do with this emotional regulation, which if we're looking at where those are in the brain, considering it as the cerebellum, one of the first points of processing input, processing the information we're getting for our body, accurately balanced and coordinated, then you see huge crossover with neurodiversity and cerebellum function. So I wouldn't say that the cerebellum is the only part of the brain that neurodiversity impacts or exists within, but I think I would say it's probably the most important part of the brain that we should be looking at considering and trying to stimulate and make sure that it's working balanced and not in this aspect of curing neurodiversity and getting these people normal, not at all. But in if you understand how your cerebellum works and where your cerebellum is creating maybe struggles and issues for you, within your neurodiversity that just gives you more information on, on coping mechanisms and movements that can help you with that brain stimulation to just help with day-to-day -day experience, to help with emotional regulation, to help with rejection sensitivity dysphoria, to help with banging into table corners and things like that. Like by no means an aspect of curing anything, but just helping in the day-to-day -day experiences of those things that can be tough. For sure. You've mentioned proprioception multiple times. Can you explain to us what that is for people that are listening that might not have heard that term before? Absolutely. Thank you for reminding me of that. I get so used to like, I'm chatting to the center. I know what it means because it's not bad at it. Perception is essentially knowing where your body is in space, which again is why we see a lot of neurodiverse people have kind of challenges with balance or bumping into things or clumsiness. Because again, a lot of folks' proprioception is just down a little bit. And so it's just that lack of internal awareness of where your body is in a space and how how it moves and how movement will impact the space around you as well. I've definitely, so since I since I started CrossFit, the Olympic lifting aspect of CrossFit 
big compound movements, full body movements. I've noticed for me when I do a movement called a snatch, which is essentially taking a barbell from the floor all the way above your head in a nice fluid motion. I don't know where my hips ever are in space to send them (laughs) far back enough to land nice and low in the snatch in the squat position. And Mm -hmm. my mobility is there, but... I just can't send my hips back because I don't know where they're going and where they exist. Right. And I don't know if you would link that as a good example for proprioception and if you have any more. I absolutely would. And I'd be so fascinated to see you do a cerebellum stimulating movement and just like sequence of movements to get that cerebellum a little bit more fired up and then see how you, how, if that would create any change to your snatch position. What we're doing to stimulate the tiny brain so i know i'm a hit uh, what what would we do yeah yeah so the cerebellum is really interesting piece of the brain and there's 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 a couple of different ways and i again probably don't even know all of them but what i default to is two different approaches one is complex movement so again the brain often the brain likes to be challenged the brain likes to be used the brain is a very very reactive and very responsive thing within our within our body you know if you want to look at it from one aspect we're meat suits piloted by it right (laughs) so sometimes challenging it and challenging it appropriately can help with that cerebellum stimulation again because the cerebellum is looking for accuracy balance and coordination if you're under stimulating that if you're doing something that you do all the time that the cerebellum barely has to check for whether it's accurate whether it's balanced whether it's coordinated then it gets a little tired and a little bored and it's not challenged. Likewise, if you're doing something too complicated that you haven't prepared up for, it's overworked, overstimulated, has a hard time navigating and identifying the errors within your movement to create appropriate feedback. So that's why I say appropriate challenge, because for some people, that's going to be taking up the complexity. And for other people, that's going to be taking it down. And just to highlight that complexity doesn't mean like doing your doing your snatch on a balance board or something, but even just like joint based movement, your elbows, how often do you move your elbows in ways that you don't usually move your elbows in, right? Like, are you challenging the elbow joint in movement patterns that it's not used to? And you can apply that to all the joints, right? So maybe you need to introduce more hip motion pre-snatch to again, just create that neural link to the cerebellum, give it something a little bit more stimulating to activate to then perform the movement again with maybe more level of stimulation. So kind of movement complexity and experimenting with movement complexity is definitely one way for cerebellum activation, which again, thinking about accuracy, balance and coordination, I would be looking at balancing movements, either standing on foot or bringing balance boards into it. Accuracy, I'd be looking at eye input, maybe catching a ball, playing catch single leg, playing catch on a balance board is a great way to kind of hit that accuracy, balance and coordination all in one. Which again, if you then do a movement and it's worse, you know that was too challenging for your cerebellum and adjust accordingly to your body. And then the second way for cerebellum activation that I know about, again, probably so many more, is to do with oxygen and CO2 levels, right? I don't remember the full science behind it, but I have done this with enough clients to see it work. And it's like magic every time where if you take a deep inhale, full inhale, and then fully exhale. So not just like a little exhale, like no air in your lungs. And then you do an activity that creates a lot of heart rate stimulation. So for folks who can stand and are comfortable doing so a lot of quick squats, right? If you can't squat, my mom, I work with my mom, she's got a lot of hip issues, squatting's a no-go. I have her sit and punch both her arms out at the same time, right? So just some kind of really cardiovascular activity. Then in that oxygen deprivation, cardiovascular input, cerebellum kicks in. And I've seen some pretty cool movement adjustments after an exercise like that. Of course, to a safe degree, making sure the individual has solid breathing down already, feels comfortable doing cardiovascular activity with full exhalation with no air in the lungs kind of thing. But that that really kind of gets the cerebellum kicking pretty, pretty quick. And I've been looking into bilateral stimulation again, something like a squat. Bilateral means both sides of the body doing the same thing at the same time. And unilateral, which means one side of the body doing one thing over another. Because the cerebellum, the brain, you know, is this kind of split in two piece. So you do absolutely have situations where only one side of the cerebellum might need that stimulation. Yeah. That was a lot of information in one go. That's cool. I'm just taking it all in. So what I'm taking from that is 
warming up is going to be key for people that struggle with knowing where their bodies are in space and that struggle with balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd say I, I get a little fussy about language and I don't mean to, but like appropriate warm up, right? Like there's a difference between, again, if you're not challenging your cerebellum in a way it needs to be challenged, I wouldn't say that's a, an appropriate warm up. I'm going to give you that proprioceptive improvement that you might be seeking. So appropriate warm up. Yeah, looking at movements that do challenge your accuracy, balance and coordination, but not so much so that you're exhausting your central nervous system battery for the workout, but also not so little that those parts of the brain that you're looking to stimulate don't get stimulated. That's awesome. For someone that who would maybe struggle with a lot of this stuff and they have no idea where to get started, what do you think is the best way to approach it? Movement whilst neurodiverse. Yeah. I love that. Through social media, through TikTok, through Instagram, I think a lot of folks have been able to share their own personal experiences. And I don't think there's anything wrong with trying that out. I will say everybody's body is unique. And don't assume that just because someone has ADHD, that what works for them will work for you. It's not the case at all. But in such a kind of broad scope of information, it's by no means a bad starting place, right? Like just trying stuff out from folks that you you trust as much as I'd say you can trust someone's social media. But I think, yeah, online, I mean, it, it's its own form of self-research, right? You're gathering information, trying it and applying it to yourself, take what works, leave what doesn't. Absolutely. I think my main piece of advice would kind of be a bit internal and maybe come across as a bit of pretentious, but to just give yourself grace. So much of the movement information in the world is focused towards white neurotypical men. And if you're not a white neurotypical man, that movement information probably isn't going to have the same impact or application to your body. And so I'd just give yourself yeah, some grace and some adjustment period as you're starting to explore this because so much of the information out there isn't for you. And it's it's going to be branded as if it's for you. It's going to be branded as a one size fits all. That's not it at all. There's this phrase within ADHD of follow the dopamine, right? Follow the dopamine in that, you know, you might be told, yeah, go running. Running is one of the best things you can do for your body. But if running feels like running through molasses and that you're like it's like using more energy to even get to the point where you're going running than you do on the run. No, running is not giving you dopamine, don't do it, right? If your dopamine, if your enjoyment of movement comes from dancing around in your kitchen, then dance around in your kitchen. If it comes from lifting heavy weights and you know how to do that safely, lift heavy weights overhead safely. If it comes from yoga, if it comes from bike rides, if it comes from hikes, if it comes from gentle mobilizations you can do laying down in bed if you love video games and you find some finger exercises that help with your finger dexterity that makes video games more enjoyable then do that i think there's a lot of like moral judgments around exercise around movement around like what's right and what's good for you and i personally don't subscribe to any of that in that sense of like every person is so different and we should just move in the ways that feel good for you. And again, that overarching umbrella, right? As long as it's not harming you, as long as it's not harming other people, then that's the right way for you to move. So I'd give yourself some grace. I'd lower your expectations of yourself and your definitions of exercise, let's say. And just, yeah, taking your time to look into what other people are doing and know that you know, it doesn't have to be really structured, right? It doesn't have to be you, you do your thing three to three times a week for an hour, like five minutes every few days. And again, as long as you're enjoying it, it makes you feel good. Great. And of course, there might be some situations with chronic pain, chronic situations that you might be looking at the need for something a little bit more structured. I personally have the same thing with food where I'm like, eat whatever you want, unless you're allergic to it. You know what I mean? Like, you have a food allergy, don't eat the food you're allergic to. But beyond that, what what possible reason could you have to restricting anything you eat in the way you eat it kind of thing? So I have the same approach to movement, right? You might be in a situation where, yeah, you might need to push through some stuff that you don't love a little bit more for your, for your personal well-being and pain levels and whatnot. But if that's not your situation, or even if it is, there's still opportunities of of engaging in ways that really engage you, bring you dopamine and are enjoyable. I genuinely believe there's forms of movement for everyone to enjoy. And again, I just think we've got to reframe how we see movement. Eye movement is movement. Breathing is movement. And for some people, 
that's the only access to movement they have. But there's a plethora of eye exercises, breathing exercises that you can do to engage and challenge the brain and the body and just make a little bit more fun. Yeah, we don't play a lot as adults. Yeah. We develop a massive fear of failure as yeah. we turn into adults. And I remember having a conversation with someone a couple of months ago, like, you know, if that's a form of movement that you don't like you don't have to do it you can try and find something else that you might enjoy more and they were like well I'd never do anything and it was like well what have you tried yeah and I think sometimes trying something new is scary but mm -hmm. then forcing yourself to run when that doesn't give you dopamine and it doesn't make you feel good for people that even aren't neurodiverse, forcing mm -hmm. yourself to do any form of movement that you don't enjoy is not going to increase the longevity of that. And you're not going to feel nice. And it's just not, it's not the one really, is it? No. And it's seen as an achievement, isn't it? It's seen as this pushing through. It's seen as this like, yeah, I spent a year of my life running at 5am every morning so that I could run this marathon. I'm like, okay, that doesn't make you better than me. Well done to see you. Yeah, like, good for you. Did you enjoy it? No, then why the hell did you do it? You're so on the nose with everything you've said in this because the second podcast episode, which if you haven't listened to, if you're listening to this, go and listen to the second episode because it's about hustle culture and it's about thinking that everybody trains five times a week and takes 5 a.m. ice baths when it's not the reality. No. And it also doesn't have to be your reality. No. And I think we have gone a bit off topic here, but... Your movement selection can be so important because, you know, I have I have clients that will, you know, they'll run, but they'll also train at the gym because they like lifting weights. But then I'll have clients that do yoga, that do roller derby, that play cricket, that play rugby, that do football. Like the the scope for everything out there is awesome. And I suppose the PT in me will always be like, lifting weights is awesome and it's just great for long-term stuff. But if people don't enjoy it, there are other ways to obviously yeah. build strength. Yeah. And again, just that expand what you view as movement. If you're really intimidated by exercise or have a really triggering experience with exercise, which I think a lot of the queer and trans community do do. Oh, yeah. Start with music. Think, you know, drums, guitar, piano. Think of the finger dexterity you're getting, the arm movement with drumming, cello, violin, all these instruments I don't know, right? That's movement. You're having to move your body to create the stimulation. Art, again, any art form, all of these things are movement in themselves. So there's ways that you can engage with movement that don't have to be exercise or even intentional movement, right? That is still stimulating your brain, still creating motion in your body, but without having to engage with something that ultimately does you more mental harm, again, if it is very triggering for you. I absolutely love that. So getting into the more logistical barriers that neurodiverse people may see um, as a barrier to movement, things like organization and planning around sessions. We've probably got a lot of people listening to this that really want to go to the gym and want a little bit of a routine to enjoy a form of movement, mm -hmm. but feeling like they can train and make a little bit of progress in the gym when they're struggling to stick to a structure. And by progress, all I mean is, you know, build strength, improve their lifts, feel good about themselves, feel comfortable in any sort of fitness space if that's what they want. But a lot of the time, the organization and the planning just day to day in terms of their life, their work, their social, adding movement into that as well feels super overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So is there any way that you would recommend that people can structure their movement in a way that's maybe less conventional, but could potentially work better for them? Yeah, I'd say if, if an aspect, if part of the struggle is like going to the place, right, going to the gym, I'd look at getting some as cheap as you is realistic for you. And again, you don't even need equipment. But if you are looking for like, well, no, I want to lift some cheap lifting options, you know, check in with your friends. If they bought things over the pandemic, they're not using anymore. Check on sales and whatnot. Get big rocks. You know, again, <laughs> lifting equipment doesn't necessarily have to be dumbbells. Fill up backpacks with things, water jugs, things like that. But get some form of equipment that you feel engaged with and that works for you. I keep it at home and keep it in the room you spend the most time. Try and make it bright. Try and keep your eye attached to it. Big thing about neurodiversity is not only out of sight, out of mind, but out of mind, out of sight. If you stop thinking, if that thing kind of becomes out of your brain, it just becomes part of the room and you literally can't see it. It will be there. 
you won't see it. So finding a way to keep it obvious, to keep it prevalent, maybe put it in the middle of the room as long as you're not going to trip over it regularly, <laughs> or maybe tripping over will help you remember that it's there. And again, just as much as you might be seeking consistency, give yourself a little grace, dismantle that a little bit, you know, chuck out however many reps you want to do with the dumbbells, two, three movements. If you feel like doing it again, do it again. If not, put them down, do it in a couple of hours or whatever. Yeah. So way more way more intuitive approach to it. Am I right in saying that you have kettlebells all over your house? I feel like I already told me that. <laughs> There's workout equipment in every room of my house pretty much so that when I walk by it, I can just be like, oh yeah, that. And I, I do that. I just crack out what I've got and I try not to like, to put that pressure on myself to, to perform a, a structured workout. But again, if you feel you need that, if that feels good for you and you're still struggling to do it, body doubling is huge within neurodiversity. Having somebody else do what you're doing with you really, really helps. So again, it's, it's kind of like a little bit more traditional advice, but find a friend, a buddy, a family member, even someone online, right? It doesn't have to be in person. If you can like video call someone whilst you're like i'm going to the gym what do you need to do they're like i've got to clean your house your house i've got to clean my house you stayed in your house while you work out right do the same activity but just knowing you and your friend are committed to we're gonna get our stuff done during this time you know you're on the phone you know airpods whatever in your ear just keep checking in with each other maybe chatting as you do it that's great. Or if, again, if you do have an in-person friend that's willing to go with you, you don't have to do the same workout. It's called body doubling. If you're not aware of it, you can look it up. But it's just this. It really helps neurodiverse folks get those tasks that they, they want to do and need to do done. So I'd say create something that's accessible for you. Leave equipment all around your house like I do. Not quite that. But, you know, make something accessible for you. Give yourself a bit of grace. Don't put pressure on yourself for it to be a really structured, regimented thing. But if you do need that, if you want that, then I'd look into body doubling as the next most, I'd say, realistic and helpful aspect to that. Hell yeah. So off the back of that body doubling, would you say that like environments where you can move with other people could be beneficial? For neurodiverse folks yeah yeah that's that's body doubling movement classes is a group of body doubles right you're all agreeing to go at this time and then the schedule's made for you that can be really helpful right where you know you just have to show up someone's going to tell you what to do exactly how to do it and everybody else in the room is doing it too that's i think for a lot of folks that's why movement classes are so appealing and to use that language like provide so much dopamine because it, it really is beneficial to a lot of neurodiverse brains again not everyone I hate people. I do like being surrounded by people in that way. I've done loads of classes in my life, but at this stage of my life now, don't like people, don't want to be around. But I absolutely see the appeal and that neural stimulation it can provide for folks. Yeah, mate, I'm, I've been the person teaching the classes um, in the commercial gym. Yeah. And yeah, believe me, I agree. Obviously, like, I never, I never thought I would be a class person, but since, since finding enjoyment in the class format, CrossFit that's become a cool thing for me when I did teach classes and I was doing spin I was teaching like all the classes had silly names they were like burn it and punch terrible <laughs> but essentially essentially all I was teaching was full body classes with some form of weights sometimes it was a kettlebell sometimes it was a dumbbell sometimes it was cardio that was that was all it was but they had they had their silly names but the people that came to the classes were very loyal they enjoyed the accountability they enjoyed the format a lot of them into familiarity and with the instructors so everyone at the gym would always have someone whose classes they liked and i would find out about that because i'd go on tour and they'd be like where were you you left me but yeah. would you say you know a familiar space a familiar environment a familiar person i think more than anything the queer community needs somewhere they feel great with. And if someone is going to take that class, they want to be around people that are going to accept them. They don't want to feel like they're being looked at. And the person, you know, being there, supporting them through the movement is not going to be the absolute worst. And shout out all of the things that we don't often want to hear in a class. Earn your dinner and stuff like that. She just like full body shuddered at that. <laughs> no, you're 100% right. Queer movement, which is my kind of like online presence now, started as a weekly workout group for queer folks. That's where it started is I was so intent on in the city that I was in. I was like, we need 
queer space for queer people, only queer people. And I, so I, so I made it in that way. And it, it started as exactly what you're talking about and exactly what we need so much more of. Also, just to highlight what you were saying, another huge bonus of classes or instructioned movement is you don't have to think about it. Neurodiverse brains are so loud and busy and so much is happening all the time that I think having someone tell you what to do is so helpful. Having someone design your workouts for you, I'd put that back in recommendations, right? If you have the means to, seek someone who can make your workouts for you because taking that mental load and pressure off of yourself to decide what to do, what's right for you, all of that is just such a nice like addition to helping work with your neurodiverse brain rather than against it. Yeah, that's just bringing a level of structure that someone might miss or not feel like they're able to create for themselves if yeah. they want it, I'm sure. Last couple of bits I want to touch on, sensory processing and mm. hypersensitivity in movement spaces. That can be a big one. A lot of affordable commercial gyms are very loud, have mm -hmm. a lot of fluorescent lighting, sometimes flashing lights, yeah. a lot of general noise, a lot of mixture of noise bleeding into each other. Obviously, we've spoken about if you don't like entering a fitness space, doing something at home. But mm -hmm. for people that really crave that space, have those sensory issues or hypersensitivity? Yeah, yeah wonderful, wonderful question. Um, noise cancelling headphones or again, music based, your own music, your own sensory calm for auditory issues. Perhaps even wearing sunglasses, you know, you might get looked at, but you think you're getting looked at anyway. So at least this kind of, you're taking that in your stride of like, I think people are looking at me anyway. I'll make myself as comfortable as possible if they're going to be doing that. You know, so wearing protection for your eyes if the lights are an issue. I wouldn't recommend a nose plug for smells, but maybe bring a little patch of something to smell for yourself. You know, a little essential oil container that you can just sniff in between sets if the smells are really overwhelming or just something that smells nice to you. And again, it's small, you can fit in your pocket, give it a little width in between set, um, sets. Touch, you might want to wear gloves if the uh, sensation of the equipment isn't good touch um, or maybe again a little towel to wrap around it or, or whatever something of the sensory sensation that works for you we shouldn't be licking anything at the gym so i don't think taste is big of an issue but i'd also consider you know i'd I'd look, I know I keep kind of throwing things that might seem a bit mad out there, but I'd look into other options, right? If you find a space that you do find sensorily good for you, let's take the library. The library feels pretty opposite to a gym. You know what I mean? Libraries yep. often have rooms to rent out. You can kind of do whatever, what is appropriate in a public space within them, right? <laughs> if you're paying a gym membership and not going to a gym, or if it's, you know, let's say your gym's like, 40 bucks a month, maybe like a library room is 10 bucks for the room. So you go four times a month, you know what I mean? And you could go with friends. You could like bring your own equipment, rent it out, create this little group for yourself in an environment that is, isn't as sensorily overwhelming for you. So I think those are the two approaches, right? Either if you have to go into that environment, make yourself as safe as possible with the sensory accommodations you need because the space isn't going to provide them so bring whatever you need in terms of hearing eyesight smell and touch so that you're good and safe or if you like know an environment that you like see if there are options for renting rooms or if you like being outside get a group of friends to create park workouts if a friend has a house with enough room little workouts at your friend's house again kind of stepping away from this this quite regimented, like we go to the gym to work out. There's other spaces you can work out in. Totally. I love that. I'm not trying to make it sound all that simple. That's still like resources. It's still expenditure. You might feel like more mental energy to, you know, set up booking the library room and whatnot, but just there's, there's more options out there. If the gym is an incredibly sensorily overwhelming space for you. I think also as queer people, we are really good at being resourceful and making yeah. the thing that we don't have. So yeah. like if we just if we just think about like queer clubs, queer bars, like yeah. we didn't have that, so we made it. Right. It's the same in the music industry, people making DIY spaces because they want a small venue that's run on its own terms. And I guess mm -hmm. if we think about things like co-ops and all sorts of that, yeah. everything that exists on a spectrum that 
isn't on the, the big capitalism umbrella. We're really good at pulling together and making resources. And I suppose coming back to things like organization and planning, if there is a bunch of queer people that want to make something in their town, there's the option to do it outside being the probably the most accessible one for a lot of people if it's local. But also, I suppose, taking advantage of a little bit of that hyper focus that we might have sometimes. Someone yeah. has the mental capacity and the spoons to pull that together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I ultimately... It comes to like, you deserve accessibility. You might have to create that for yourself, but you can. And you're not alone, right? Like you don't have to do this alone. I'm sure there is someone in people's lives, again, maybe not physical, maybe it is online, but like there are groups, virtual spaces, physical spaces, virtual friends, physical friends that can you can band together with to create these things that you need and deserve. For sure. And I think I think a lot of the time, all we want is just that space to feel like validated and understood in and feel good in as well. And a lot of the time they are not conventional spaces for us. Yeah. And I just touch back to the thing that you mentioned about being in the gym and thinking that everyone is looking at you. Yeah. Um, I had one of my humans say to me today, they hadn't trained in a little while. They went back to the gym and they were like, I don't think anyone at the gym is looking at me I think it might just be my autism mm -hmm. is that a common trait of neurodiversity thinking that people in other spaces may be watching us I think it's that hyper awareness of other people to it's it's I think in itself a form of masking right we as yep. neurodiverse people are constantly observing others to pick up on the social cues to pick up on the things we know we miss at so I think it's also this well, that's what I do. Why wouldn't other people be doing it to me? And also this sense of feeling othered and being observed as othered. I think those are the two aspects yeah. of it. One that, you know, we are more inherently observational than I think neurotypical people and we are considered. And so I think there's the assumption that we're, we're getting looked at or observed negatively. And I think it's hard, it's, it's hard to, to move through those two, th those two mindsets, right? Yeah, but yeah, I think that's really common in neurodiversity for, from those two, yeah, those two aspects. Awesome. Yeah. So how can people find you? Where do you exist? Where do I exist? I exist in a really hot place right now. But yeah, the queer movement on Instagram is mostly where I'm at. I technically have a TikTok still, but I'm not there. It tells you to go to the Instagram. I've also got my website, queermovement.com. Very creative, I know. And those are kind of like my free resource options. Financial accessibility is super important for me. So I have personalized one-on-one -on -one options starting from 10 bucks and kind of a, a lot more personalized one-on-one -on -one work available. Yeah, you have some amazing posts for so many different things. A lot of them top surgery related, a lot mm -hmm. of them not. When you start following MJ, if you don't already, you'll see their ty the type of posts that they do. You will start seeing them everywhere because they are shared so much because that's how awesome they are. You're the first movement profession I worked with with a really long time. So if you're listening to this from Lucinda Socials and you've been thinking about working with them, as someone who has worked with them, I do highly, highly recommend it. It was... This is not about me. I mean, the podcast I'm making it is about, about me, but this is not about <laughs> this on you as much as i want yes people that is another episode smashed out i'm really really excited about my guests that i have next week as well please let me know what you think and as always if there's anyone that you want to hear on this podcast please reach out to me on instagram and let me know don't forget to sign up to that cultivate free week of online group coaching if you are intended to because i've not got many spaces left and I hope you all have an awesome weekend. I'll catch up with you next week.